Hey friends, Booty Cothran here. We are at Motive School of Movement in Greenville, South Carolina. And today I'm gonna to teach you everything you need to know about how to build your own warped wall. Now, there are no set specs or standards for warped wall design. So when it comes to setting the difficulty level of running up your wall, you are the boss and in complete control. So we're gonna cover some design concepts first to show you how to set that difficulty level and what you wanna do with that. And then we're gonna go over the construction and the materials. It's all gonna be pretty easy. So let's get started. To demonstrate, we'll lay out a couple of pieces of plywood on the floor in an L-shaped pattern. The bottom piece is laid horizontally and is where the run-up will begin, and the top piece is laid vertically and is where the platform edge will be that the runner is reaching for. Now, plywood comes in four by eight sheets, so if you want a wall that's up to 12 feet tall, you can get away with only two pieces like this per side, and if you want to build a wall that's a taller wall, you just add any additional pieces vertically above the second to get the height that you want. To simplify, let's begin with the shorter wall heights of 8, 10, and 12 feet tall. One way to think about the curve on a warped wall is that it is nothing more than a portion of a circle. And no matter what height your wall is, you can modify the difficulty level of the wall by making changes to the size of the circle and to its vertical position on the wall. First, let's look at changes to the size of the circle. If you remember your geometry from high school, the radius of a circle is the distance in a straight line from its center point to the outside edge in any direction. In this case, we're using a curve with a radius of about eight feet. You can see how the eight foot radius works okay on the eight foot wall height, but at the 10 and 12 foot wall heights, it creates too much of an overhang. So if we're building a 10 or a 12 foot tall wall, we'd probably wanna use a larger curve, and we do that by changing the length of the radius. By using a longer radius, the circle becomes larger, which relaxes the curve. This makes the run-up more gradual and easier while also decreasing the amount of overhang at the top. Likewise, if we use a shorter radius, the circle becomes smaller, creating a tighter, more difficult curve while also increasing the amount of overhang at the top of the wall. Now, maybe even more important than the size of the circle is its vertical position on the wall. We refer to this as the amount of drop. A curve with its center point in the uppermost position has zero drop. This is the easiest position the curve can be placed in because it creates the most gentle transition from the floor into the run-up and the least amount of overhang at the top. In most cases, the curve will be dropped down anywhere from 6 to 18 inches, possibly 24, but a drop larger than that begins to really increase the difficulty and you might consider increasing your radius a bit to compensate. Here let's look at our 8 foot tall wall. We'll start with our curve placed in the highest vertical position it can be before it comes off the wall at the bottom. The higher up the curve is positioned, the easier it will be to run up. Notice the point at the bottom where the run up begins, how we have a smooth, gentle transition from the floor into the curve, and also the point at the top of the platform edge where there is minimal, if any, overhang. Now we'll connect a line between those two points to highlight the angle and watch what happens as we move the position of the center point down. The bottom point moves toward the back of the wall, and at the same time, the top point moves toward the front of the wall. With that one move, the transition from the floor into the curve becomes much more abrupt, and the overhang at the top has also increased. So even though the height of the wall and the size of the curve are both exactly the same as when we started, by moving the center point down, the angle becomes much more vertical, creating a steeper angle of ascent and a more difficult curve to run up. And with all the possible combinations of wall height, radius length, and vertical position, you're nearly unlimited with customizing the difficulty level of your wall. You might, for example, choose to use a longer radius, creating a more gentle and easier curve, but place it in a lower vertical position to add some difficulty. Moving the curve horizontally will not affect the difficulty level, but once you decide on its vertical position, you will want to be sure you pull your curve as close to the front of the wall as you can before it comes off the plywood at the bottom. This allows you to make the most out of your lumber and gives you the largest platform you can get at the top. Now, I'm a little bit old school. Sometimes I like to actually sketch it out on paper in a tangible form that I can put my hands on. Using graph paper or a ruler as a scale, I mark the floor level first, then draw a line up to my desired wall height. In this case, we'll do a 14 and a half foot wall. This is what's standard now on American Ninja Warrior. Then I measure and mark my plywood pieces. For the curve, I'll use a new piece of paper, measure out a 12 foot radius and mark it. I create a loop in the end of a piece of string, which will hold my pencil, 
measure out the string to match my 12 foot dimension, hold down at the center point, pull it tight and draw the curve. Then I cut the curve out and can experiment with its placement on the wall until I get the look that I want. Now let's talk about the construction. For the plywood that makes up your sidewalls, I'd recommend you use plywood that's three quarters of an inch thick. You can get away with half inch if you like, but you might wanna be sure you've got some solid framing behind it to make sure it's nice and stable. We'll talk about the surface layer in a minute. We start by laying out our plywood on the ground in the L-shaped pattern. I like to screw the pieces together at the seam with a scrap of wood to keep them from moving as I work. Measure a piece of rope or string the length of your radius and secure it where you want your center point to be. Pull it tight and use a pencil at the other end to draw your curve onto the plywood. Next, you'll raise your plywood off the ground and use a jigsaw to cut along the curve. Remember, you have two sides to cut, so you can either double stack your plywood and cut both sides at one time, or use the first set to trace the curve onto the second set. After both of your sides are cut, you can screw the pieces together and run a belt sander along the edges to get them smooth and consistent. Thanks to Glenn Davis for that tip. Now let's talk about the width of your walls. Since plywood comes in four by eight sheets, it makes sense to create your wall either four feet wide or eight feet wide. To connect the side pieces together and create the framing that's going to support our surface layer, I like to use two by six material. You can get away with two by fours, but I like the added stability and strength of two by six, particularly for a wall that's gonna be in a gym that's gonna get a lot of use. Our next step is to connect the side pieces with the two by six joists at the four corners using three long screws in the ends of each one. For the joists at the front of the wall where the run-up begins, I like to use a table saw to cut an angle along the front edge joist, which allows it to be positioned closer to the front. This will give your surface layer some needed support at the base of the wall where it's so thin. To connect the top side walls, screw two by six joists flat onto the top of the bottom section, connect the upper side pieces and continue adding joists spaced six inches apart along the curve making sure that the top of the joist is flush with the edges of the plywood sidewalls. I also like to use a scrap of wood to secure the sidewalls together at the seams on the inside of the wall. If you're building a multi-height wall, you'll simply cut your joist in half at whatever height you desire, moving one of your sidewalls to the middle to meet your joist. Now for the surface layer, you can use half inch plywood, but it's really tough to bend and conform to the curve. There are some tricks to do that if you wanna do it, one of which is to soak it in water overnight or to cut some grooves in one layer of the plywood and allowing it to be easier to be bent. That seems like a bit of an ordeal to me. One tip that I learned from Bobby Zavala is to use ratchet straps to pull the plywood to the wall so that you can screw it into place. I did this for my outdoor wall and it worked really well. But the best method I've discovered is what we did here at Motive, which is to use three layers of a thinner plywood, like quarter inch or a product called Luon, which is much easier to work with and flexible, easy to, to adapt to the curve. For the first layer, we used a minimal amount of screws, just enough to consistently pull it into the curve. Be sure that you countersink your screws just enough to sit below the surface of the plywood. While adding the surface layer, you'll likely need to go behind the wall and add another joist or two where the seams meet. For the second surface layer, we staggered the seams of the plywood and used a more generous amount of screws going through both layers. And then for the final layer, we spread construction glue on the surface of the second layer as we applied the top layer, staggering the seams again, and then used finish nails to go through all three layers. With this process, you end up with a nice, nearly three quarter inch thick surface layer that will take a lot of punishment. Finish the top by cutting a piece of plywood for the platform and brace it underneath to give it plenty of support. For the grip rail, use a dowel that's about one and a quarter inch to one and a half inches and cut it flat on one side, maybe one quarter inch deep. Use long screws to attach that rod to the platform and the substructure to be sure it is attached well. You do not want to have that rod peel off of there with somebody at the top of that wall. To finish the wall, use joint compound or wood putty to fill in any remaining seams and holes, sand it smooth, and apply a primer and paint of your choice. For an exterior wall, I like to use the thick textured deck paint to give it good weather protection and some extra grip. Also for an exterior wall, if you can orient the wall where the curve faces south, that will give it the most sun exposure during the day and help keep it dry after a rain. That's it. Leave us a comment or any questions. Thanks for watching and come see us here at Motive School of Movement in Greenville, South Carolina.